All right, everyone, welcome to the Security of Classic Game Consoles. My name is Kevin Shackleton. I'm a Vice President and Distinguished Engineer at Cerner. I've been there for 15 years and done a lot of different things. Uh, one of my responsibilities currently is over the uh, cybersecurity uh, strategy and implementation in our engineering organization. So I get to work with all of our engineering teams on running secure code and making security a first class design concern in the software and systems we build. Now, growing up in the 80s, Nintendo was my life. I begged my parents for a Nintendo when I was a kid, and when I was in fourth grade, I finally got a Nintendo for my birthday. And my Nintendo and I were inseparable. Um, so I had a, a lot of great times playing games, and for those who grew up in the 80s, or even if you have any passing familiarity with, with Nintendo, you knew that it ruled the 80s and, and a large part of the 90s. However, the video game industry actually uh, suffered a major, major downfall in 1983 when it went from a $3 billion a year industry to $100 million in just a single year. So they had a massive crash in 1983 that actually lasted for two years. Now retrospectively, one of the major causes of the video game crash in 1983 is a glut of games that were just coming out. So Atari, uh, one of the, you know, the most popular system at that time, had over 700 games developed for it. And only a fraction of these games actually came from Atari. Uh, a lot of the games were just really, really terrible games that flooded the market. Now, in the fall of 1985, Nintendo was introduced here in the United States, and then it went widespread the following year, and it really resurrected the video game industry in the mid-80s. Now, Nintendo learned from the crash of 1983, and so they introduced with all of their games this seal of quality. Now, for those who are familiar with this game here, Friday the 13th, will know that this was one of the worst video games of all time. So clearly, this seal had nothing to do with quality whatsoever. Now, what this seal of quality actually meant was that, as a developer, your game had to be exclusive to the Nintendo for two years, so they locked you in. Also, you could only develop at most five games per year for the Nintendo, so Nintendo was, was uh, constraining the market of games. There was also a content review, so before Apple started doing their iOS App Store reviews, Nintendo was doing it with Nintendo games, so they'd review it for violence, sex, objectionable content, and so forth. And then, and this is the most crucial part here, is actually Nintendo controlled the entire manufacturing process for game cartridges. So this part of the 13th game was produced by Nintendo, or manufactured by Nintendo, and the developer actually had to pay Nintendo up front for the manufacturing costs. And if, as a developer, you said, okay, I wanted 100,000 copies of this game produced, Nintendo might say, well, we can only do 75,000. Like, okay. And then Nintendo would say, well, we want the full amount of the money to produce all 75,000 games. And if you didn't sell your entire inventory, you were stuck with the bill. Nintendo had zero risk here. Now, how did Nintendo actually enforce this? Because it seems like a terrible deal for developers. And I'll get into that um, in a little bit here. But I want to transition to, a, transition to an actually an awesome game. So uh, Mega Man 2, which is one of my favorite games of, of all time. It's, it's regarded as a very great game. And what I'd like to do for the rest of this presentation, if you'll, if you'll indulge me for a bit, is we'll con continue the presentation here from my Nintendo, uh, my modified Nintendo with my modified Mega Man 2 game. And we'll talk about the security of game consoles. So how is Nintendo able to uh, enforce those licensing, licensing restrictions. How are other game companies um, follow suit and incorporate security in their consoles? And what can we learn about that and, uh, and take that back to the software and systems we built? So let me uh, switch over here. I'm not going to blow on it. Side note, blowing on it actually produces condensation and will corrode out the connectors. Says <laughs> you. <laughs> All right, so we've got Mega Man 2 here. The text is very small, but I've actually modified it a bit, so it's not exactly uh, Mega Man 2, but I'm going to make one more change here, and uh, that's much better here. Okay, so I said uh, I started off talking about the Nintendo, and we're actually gonna uh, start with that. So, and if you don't appreciate my my transitions here, and if, actually, who's played Mega Man Two? This week. This is <laughs> the T-shirt is coming right at you. <laughs> All right. So, if, if I were to open up my Nintendo here, this is actually what the motherboard looks like inside. 
And remember, Nintendo's seal of quality, or seal of approval, seal of quality, how do they enforce that? And it was actually done through security as a first class design concern of the Nintendo. And so this chip right here is actually crucial to that. So if we zoom in on it, this is called the Nintendo Checking Integrated Circuit, or CIC, also known as the 10S chip. So this effectively is a lock inside of your console. And the video game over there, if we open up its cartridge, that actually has the corresponding chip. It's the exact same chip inside the cartridge. Remember how Nintendo manufactured all the games, all the cartridges? They put that chip inside of the cartridge. What's fascinating to me is that these chips are actually the exact same chip. Literally, they're the exact same. They're just wired differently. So on the, your console, this takes positive 5 volts of power because I'm drawing power from my console. In that scenario, the chip acts as a lock. In the game cartridge, it doesn't draw any power. There's no power on those games. So in that scenario, it acts as a key. When you turn on your system, the game is connected to the console, and the lock over here on the CIC chip sends a seed. That seed goes to your key. Both the lock and the key chip do a series of calculations. They produce a result. The key sends the result back to the lock. The lock compares the results. If the, if the result matches, then the lock knows it's talking to a legitimate key and it allows the game to run. How does it do that? The lock is actually uh, holding a reset line on the CPU. If it cannot establish a communication with the key uh, that's, and it determines to be legitimate, it will reset the CPU. So if you've ever put a Nintendo game in, remember how you guys were all joking about you should blow on the cartridge? When you put that cartridge in and you'd see the red dot flashing on the console and you'd see the game flicker, about one second. Well, that's because it's actually running at one hertz, and it's not able to establish a successful communication between the CIC chips, and so it's resetting the CPU. Now, how do we defeat this? Well, Nintendo patented this entire process, and they, they actually describe it in great detail. They don't talk about the code that's actually running on the chip, but that's okay. We don't need that. Inside of the patent, it describes an error scenario where instead of a lock key scenario, if you run into a key key scenario, that's an error state and in which case the CIC doesn't do anything. So what does that mean? If we snip this pin here, pin four, on our chip on the console, that's where it's drawing the positive five volts power. Now the chip no longer gets power. Remember how I said in, in the scenario we run the cartridge and things to the key? Now we've got two keys. And what happens here in the, in the security uh, world, we call this a fail open design. So in the failure scenario, it fails open and everything actually just works. So it's an interesting design choice on the case of Nintendo engineers. Uh, the opposite of this would be a failed closed design where if it detected this error scenario, it reset the CPU. Now, this is just one type of attack. There's another type of attack that the CIC is susceptible to. And that's knocking it offline by a rogue cartridge. So there was unlicensed game developers who developed game cartridges that when they, wrote their own, when they produced their own cartridge, they don't have a CIC chip. So instead what they put there was a voltage regulator that sent negative five volts to the CIC chip. <laughs> now remember, the CIC chip draws positive five volts. What that would actually do is knock the chip offline while your console was on, rendering it inoperable. Now Nintendo actually wised up to this, so they weren't checking their inputs, right? They weren't considering that they would get a malicious cartridge plugged in there. So in future revisions in the Nintendo, they added a diode on there to protect against voltage spikes to block out those type of attacks. Now there's one final attack that the CIC is susceptible to, and that's simply reverse engineering and cloning the, the chip. Now, the console and the game here, I have access to this, right? So effectively this is like client-side logic, right? I have total control over it. So I can reverse engineer and see how that works. And actually, that's what a company called Tengen did. So Tengen, if you're not familiar, is actually Atari. So Atari just created a subsidy called Tengen to produce Nintendo games. Inside of here is a clone of that CIC chip that they call the rabbit chip. Okay, now let's talk about the Sega Saturn. So, the Sega Saturn was notable in that it's one of the uh, initial consoles that had a CD-based media here. So, their media, their games, were on a CD, just like any other uh, like a normal CD, except there's one crucial change. And that is in the outer ring of this CD, was what's called, what we call now, a static wobble signature. Basically, it's a regular CD, but Sega created their own CD readers and CD writers that were capable of writing a unique signature in the outer ring that is not readable by any normal CD drive. So, what does this mean? Well, 
For an attackers, the work factor of trying to attack that was incredibly high. You would have to go reverse engineer, first of all, how to read that signature, how to write that signature, what the signature was, and produce a machine capable of copying disks. So, and actually, it's, this actually has yet to be broken. No one has actually broken this particular security measure. Now, going back to our client side logic, it's possible to break it because we have access to a Saturn and we can see how the actual the reader's writing. But as security folks, we know that there's actually probably other ways that are more useful to attack the Saturn. And that's actually what happened here. Um, but first, uh, that work factor is actually described in a 1975 paper called The Protection of Information in Computer Systems. It's a fantastic paper. A lot of research papers I understand can be dense. This one actually is very readable. I encourage you guys to check it out. It basically goes through a bunch of security design patterns uh, that are still very relevant today. But the way the Saturn was attacked uh, is one of the ways is with a disk swap attack, which is effectively a timing attack. So you put in a legitimate disk into your Saturn. The Saturn reads that security signature on the ring, and before it loads the game, you yank out the disk and you put in your, your burned or pirated uh, disk. Uh, a lot of uh, CD-based systems are susceptible to these swap type attacks. And then another type of attack, and this is not surprising at all, is, is mods. So people have access to the hardware, they can go figure out how to rewire the system, you know, snip a pin here, uh, solder on some wires over here, and bypass some of the, uh, the security measures, um, or bypass that, that signature reading. So uh, there's obviously risks with that where you can break your, your Saturn. It requires um, some technical aptitude. Um, but you know, the, the, the point here is that attackers just said, OK, we're not going to bother trying to attack the media format because that's just going to be too much time. Let's go look at other attack vectors. Next up is the Sony PlayStation. So the Sony PlayStation was released in 1993. It had uh, a, a very great run throughout the 90s. It also was a, a, uh, a disc-based format, just like the Saturn. It actually utilized uh, the exact uh, same concept of having a signature in the outer ring. Only the Saturn, or only the PlayStation could, could read and write that ring. Uh, but the PlayStation actually was susceptible from a major, major design flaw. Now, first let's talk about the, what the PlayStation did when you booted up a game. So the first thing, it would read that CD-ROM, that wobble region of data on the disk, and verify that it was accurate or, or match what it expected. Interestingly, we actually know what that data is. It's just four characters. It's either Sony Computer of America or Sony Computer of Japan. It's four characters. Um, so it's, it's really easy uh, uh, to know what that is. Um, and then next, it would read some license screen text in the game header and display that on the screen. And it had to match exactly what it was expecting, something like licensed by Sony. If those two things match up, it was, the game would load. Well, the design flaw in the PlayStation is this parallel port down here, which is why I'm showing the back of the PlayStation. And the parallel port, uh, the, the terrible thing about it is it had access to the stream buffer of data coming off of the laser head that was reading your disk. So attackers created a simple device, no soldering, no modding required. Uh, you just plugged it into your parallel port, it would hijack the stream data coming off of the laser, and when the system was saying, I want to read that signature in the, in the outer uh, edge of the disk, it would say, oh, here you go, here's the four characters that you're expecting. And so now the OS is, not, is thinking that it's getting the data off the disk, when in fact it's coming from the parallel port, okay? And then that license screen text, uh, it was uh, just telling the console to, to swap disks, and in a multi-disc game, that license text was only on the first disc. And so if the system thought that it was switching to the second disc, it would just ignore this, this check here. So what is the lesson learned here? Well, first is that uh, going back to that 1975 paper, there's the concept of least privileges. So you know, it's something, a system, an entity should have only the privileges that it needs. I would argue that the parallel port in the back of the PlayStation should have no reason to access the stream buffer uh, from the laser you know, reading from the CD. It you know, should be a separate concern there. And actually, Sony uh, agreed with me. Uh, of course they would. And so this was the PlayStation when it was introduced. And five years later, they actually re released a revision that just flat out removed the parallel port. Um, and this follows another uh, security principle, which is described in that paper as economy of mechanism. But we know this today is keep it simple or keep it simple stupid, right? Simpler systems are going to be easier to reason about. They're easier to test. Um, and you'll, you'll be able to make them more secure. So all things equal, 
A simple system versus a complex system, I put my money on the simple system being far more secure. And so by removing the parallel port, they reduce the attack surface area of the PlayStation, they remove that attack vector completely. All right, next up, let's talk about the Dreamcast. So back to Sega. Uh, so the Sega Dreamcast, uh, a fantastic system, unfortunately very short-lived. Um, so remember the Saturn had that custom format? Well, Sega, and that was also by Sega, Sega introduced a brand new format. They, def they designed an entirely new media for their system. So no longer were games on CD-ROMs. Now it's on something called a GD-ROM. Looked just like a CD-ROM, but packed more data on there. And no one made GD-ROM readers, no one made GD-ROM writers. Only Sega did. So now that you think this, they've, they've solved it, right? Well, this, the Dreamcast actually supported three formats. The first is compact audio discs. But it's an audio disc, forget about that, that's worthless. Next up was the GD-ROM, which I talked about. But no one knows how the heck to read or write those discs. Forget about that attack vector. There's this third format here. No one's ever heard of this, probably. It's called MIL-CD. MIL-CD is actually a brand new format, also from Sega, introduced at the same time the Dreamcast came out. What the MIL-CD was, was it, was, it was an audio CD with executable code. Now, you guys all can imagine, anytime you add executable code into the mix here, it's not good, right? The intention by the MIL-CD was that it was an interactive CD-ROM. Um, as it turns out, there was only seven uh, actual MIL-CDs ever produced, um, so it was, very, it was a very unused format. But what the attackers were able to figure out was that how could we take a Dreamcast game and put it onto Mill CD? So they were, most games actually didn't even take the full space, so they could just copy them directly to a CD. For games that were too large, they had to downsample the art or sound. They burned that onto a CD, put executable code according to the Mill CD format, which was well documented, and basically injected code into the Dreamcast, and that's how Dreamcast were able to play burned games without any modification whatsoever. Um, so very, very clever. And what we learned from all this, especially this one, attacks follow the path of least resistance. So whatever the easiest attack vector is, that's where the attackers are going to go. Now, what can we look at for systems of today? Because we've talked about some uh, you know, old, much older systems. What about newer systems today? Now, with basically all systems that are, are, are fairly recent, uh, the work factor of attacking the hardware, all those hardware protections, has pretty much blocked um, everyone. And that, that's not to say that uh, it's, not, it's not possible, but the systems are so complex, there's so many, the knowledge required to analyze the hardware and the you know, componentry is so um, intense now that this is not the attack vector that attackers are going after. Certainly, some people will, but this is not the easiest way to go. Now things have moved into the space that all of us are very much aware of, which is the software. So here's Fantasy Star Online, a game for the GameCube, and this game was an online game that connected to uh, Sega's uh, server. And in the game, you could set up your uh, internet settings to connect to Sega's server. And one of those settings was the DNS uh, IP address that you wanted to use for your DNS server. Well, attackers figured out that if they put in their own IP address to say that they were the DNS server, then they, d they through DNS hijacking, you know, purported to be the actual game server from Sega, but it was really the malicious server that they controlled. And then on that malicious server, they told the game, hey, here's an update for you to take. There's a new version of the game. So the game would take this executable code and execute it, and then it rooted the GameCube. Zelda The Twilight Princess, a fantastic game, which was a launch title for the, the Wii. Uh, they, there was a save game file that the game would utilize on a, you know, like an SD card. And in that save game file was the name of Link's horse, so your character's horse. And attackers realized that if they put in a, uh, a value that was nonsensical into that field, they could execute a buffer overflow uh, in the game. When it, the game was loading up and reading your save game file, the buffer overflow would execute some executable code on the, on the save game disk, and then you would root the Wii. So again, another attack through software, through the game. And of course, the developers of the game didn't think that anybody would be writing a malicious save game file. They're thinking, we're the ones writing the file. No one else is going to do that. And then finally, the Nintendo Switch. This just came out this year, and it's already had untrusted <laughs> code running on it. Now, how has the Nintendo Switch already been hacked? Well, the Nintendo Switch, like many modern consoles, comes with a browser built in. That browser is a WebKit browser. That WebKit browser that it was shipped with is six months old, right? It was probably new when it was started the manufacturing, but six months old now, there's a known CVE, a known vulnerability, and attackers were able to simply uh, 
you know, exploit that known vulnerability. So components with known vulnerabilities exist in game consoles now. Um, so what is the moral of this story here? So hopefully you've learned some security principles in a fun way through these consoles. And my hope is that you take some of these, these uh, concepts back to the software and systems that you build today. Thank you very much, and uh, have a good rest of the conference. Thanks a lot, Kevin. Thanks a lot, Kevin. All right, we'll take about a five-minute break and meet back here. I don't have to. I don't have to. I don't know.